Well, former Gonzaga Bulldogs guard Joel Ayayi is fresh off a new contract signed with the Orlando Magic, reuniting him with Jalen Suggs. So today we are going to preview what his second professional season might look like right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today is the third part in our series discussing every Gonzaga Bulldog in the NBA. We are doing season preview episodes. Segment one is a look at the player's history leading up to where they are currently. Segment two is the best and worst case scenarios for what their upcoming NBA season might look like. And segment three is a expected role, expected production for each player. We started out with Andrew Nembhard last week. We talked about Rui Hachimura last week as well. Now, in light of the latest update about our Zags in the NBA, we are talking all things Joel Ayayi today. Joel's bounced around quite a bit, but just recently signed with the Orlando Magic. I will start way back in the beginning. Joel joined the Zags way back in 2017 out of Paris, France. Another Frenchman joining the Zags, Roni Turioff, Killian Tilly. There have been a lot of excellent Frenchmen who have played for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Joel was one of the best of the business. He joined the team in 2017. He redshirted during his first season because he was 17 years old. He was one of the youngest players in college basketball that season. Sat out 17-18, came and joined the team in the 18-19 season. Didn't see a whole lot of him in year one. That's not surprising. Of course, Mark Few has a very particular development program, often with the international players, and we've seen it pay off tremendously with guys like Rui Hachimura in the past. And for Joel, he's one of the team's best success stories in terms of international recruiting. Again, a guy who redshirted entirely in year one, and in year two, he played under six minutes per game. He only played in 23 games. Average under two points, one and a half rebounds per game. At that time, it was pretty unclear whether Joel was ever going to really materialize into a legitimate rotation piece for the Zags. He ended up doing much, much more than that. Exploded into a huge role during that 2019-2020 season. He began the year in a bench role, but was playing significant minutes. Transfer Admon Gilder ended up missing time with a wrist injury. That allowed Joel to step into the starting lineup. And even though Gilder came back pretty quickly, Joel was cemented in that starting lineup. He never gave up a starting spot again after that. Gilder switched into a sixth man and, to his credit, handled it absolutely spectacularly well. And if there was anything going on behind the scenes, it got quickly nipped in the bud. There never seemed to be any issues of camaraderie on that team. And Gilder handled that six man role extremely well. And Joel really started to show us who he is as a basketball player, 33 games that season, 23 of them in the starting lineup. He played a hair under 30 minutes per game. So just about immediately he established established himself as a guy who was going to play big minutes in this program. He averaged 10 and a half points, six and a half rebounds, and just over three assists per game while shooting just under 35% from three. We knew after that season that Joel was primed for something real big in year three, his fourth year as a Gonzaga student. And sure enough, That was the case. 2020-2021 was, of course, an outstanding season for Gonzaga as a whole. They were undefeated going into the national championship game against Baylor. Joel was a huge part of that team and that program and the success that they had. 32 games, 31 of them in the starting lineup, and he played 31 minutes per game. So again, still a guy playing the vast majority of minutes for one of the best college basketball teams of the last decade. Joel Joel averaged 12 points, 6.9 rebounds. 2.7 assists and shot a career high 39% from deep. Joel's one of those guys who just does everything well. He's a good rebounder. He's a good passer. He's a good shooter. He's a good scorer. He just does everything well at that time coming off of an excellent season. He was all WCC 
it looked like he was going to get drafted. There were some mocks that had him as, as high as a late first or early second round pick. I think Milwaukee was picking 32nd, and that was a very popular destination of, hey, I think this is where Joel's going to go. I think this makes some sense for him. Not only did he not go in the early second round or late first round, Joel went undrafted entirely in that 2021 draft. It was a very surprising thing to see as the draft went on. We continued to not see Joel's name. Within about five minutes of the draft ending, it was reported that Joel Eiei was signing a contract with the Los Angeles Lakers to join them during summer league. This is not uncommon to see players who maybe could have gotten drafted but are perhaps choosing to pick the team that they want to go to as opposed to if you get drafted 59th overall your odds of making a roster as the 59th overall pick versus an undrafted free agent they're probably a little bit higher if you got drafted I I would have to look at the numbers but I'm almost certain they are but I could understand the appeal of like but what if I could if five or six teams are interested in signing me as an undrafted free agent and I get to pick which of those teams to go to as opposed to, you know, just hoping that whatever team drafts me is going to be invested in me is going to, you know, attempt to, to get me into the, the fold right away. I can understand the appeal of trying to sign your contract and pick a team. I don't know exactly what happened with Joel. I know that his contract was, was signed or at least reported very quickly after the draft. So it's almost certain that he was having some conversations or his representatives were having some of those conversations before the actual draft completed. Regardless, Joel ended up in L.A. and he played not particularly well in Summer League. Uh, We've talked about this a little bit on the show before. Particularly for a player like Joel, Summer League is just not a good environment for his style of play. He's a system guy. He's a role guy. He's not a guy who's going out and and playing a lot of one-on-one basketball and trying to get his shot that way. He's more of a – he fits better in in a structured offense. And Summer League is the exact opposite of that. It's all guys trying to get their bag, trying to earn their money, trying to showcase their skills. And there's nothing wrong with that. I understand if you got two weeks in Las Vegas and that's the, de- the, the significant determining factor on whether you're going to be an NBA player or not, you're going to do everything you can to make sure you look good. I get it. I totally get it. But it doesn't. it's not conducive to Joel's style of basketball. And unfortunately, we saw that show up in that summer league. He didn't play well. It was not surprising the Lakers let him go. He ended up signing on with Washington. Briefly, the Wizards were a three-zag team with Rui Hachimura, Corey Kispert, and Joel Eiei. He spent the entire season in Washington, or at least with the Wizards organization. He was on a two-way contract. He spent the majority of the season in Capital City with the Go-Go's, their G League affiliate over there. Uh, He was awesome in the G League. There's no no surprise on my end at all that Joel killed it at that level. Again, a bit more structured, a bit more organized, and just it's good basketball in the G League, but Joel's he's he's good for that level. He's going to be good. His numbers bear that out. Ten and a half points per game, 6.6 assists, 5.7 rebounds in 31 minutes per night. That is fantastic production, borderline elite production. He's never going to be a 20-point-per-game scorer. That's not his style. But to be able to put up 10, 6, and 6, In 30 minutes per game, that is incredible. He also appeared in seven NBA games. He played about 20 minutes in the NBA total, mostly in garbage time. Didn't really get a chance to showcase his skills. He did score. He is officially in the books as an NBA scorer, so he's got that going for him, but never really got a chance to to showcase what he can do at the NBA level. Most of his production last year, basically all of his production last year, was at the G League level. After that, he was released from his two-way deal in March and didn't sign on with anybody until he caught on with the Atlanta Hawks for this year's Summer League. He was better this year in Summer League, averaged about 5.6 boards, 2.5 assists, and and 1.5 steals per game. He shot under 23% from deep, though, and ultimately I think that that really sunk his ability to sign a new contract right away. Atlanta wasn't interested. They signed a couple other guys from their summer league affiliate to two-way contracts. Uh, Washington didn't come calling again. Los Angeles didn't come calling again. Even though he looked good in summer league, it wasn't a shock to see him kind of spin his wheels a little bit for a while. Eventually what ended up happening is his returning player rights as a G league player were traded in a three-way deal to the Orlando magic or I suppose I should say the Lakeland magic, which is the G league affiliate of the Orlando magic. A couple weeks after that trade went down, we got the report on Monday evening that the Orlando Magic are signing Joel Eiei to a contract. It is a non-guaranteed contract. It does not mean that he is guaranteed to start the season with the Orlando Magic. We're going to talk a little bit more 
about what that looks like in the second segment while also exploring what are the best case scenarios for Joel Eiai in his second professional season and what are the worst case scenarios for Joel Eiai in year two. Before we get to all that, though, I want to tell you all about Upside. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts. And it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. The app is crazy to easy, easy to use, and there's no catch. To get started, download the free Upside app. Use my promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit card or debit card, and you get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's part of why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get five or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using code LOCKED. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked on Zags. And I want to thank all of you who have made Locked on Zags your first listen of the day, as well as those of you who are watching on YouTube. If you are a listener to the show and you have not done so yet, just go to youtube.com, hit that big subscribe button. The goal of Locked on Zags is to get to 1,000 subscribers before the Zags take on North Florida on November 7th to kick off the regular season. That means we have almost two months to get to 1,000 subscribers, I'm very confident we're going to get there, but I still need your help. So if you haven't done so yet, again, very simple. Just go to YouTube, find the Locked on Zags channel. You'll see every podcast we have done organized into different playlists, all the mailbag episodes, all the season in review episodes like this one for the previews. All of them are there. Go check it out, youtube.com. Appreciate it. All right, we're talking best case, worst case scenarios for Joel Eiai here in the second segment as he heads into his second professional season. This is a segment I do not just for the NBA players, but for the actual Gonzaga players as well. We're going to start that in October leading up to the season. One of the caveats for best and worst case scenario, we're not talking injury. Yeah, Joel could get hurt tomorrow. He could miss the season. That's obviously something Gonzaga fans saw with Chet Holmgren earlier this month. Uh, really sad to see that happen for Chet. I'm not going to sit here and discuss how that could happen for Joel too. We all know that injuries are a part of the game. Uh, hopefully that is not the case, but we're not going to address that. We're also going to keep the best case scenarios within realistic outcomes. Julia is not going to win the NBA MVP this year. It's just not a realistic outcome for him as a best case scenario. Sure, it would be the best case scenario. It's just not reasonable. So we're going to talk about that now. The best case scenario for Joel Eiai, quite frankly, is that he makes the Orlando Magic's roster. That he beats out other inexperienced Orlando guards for a roster spot. There are nine guards competing for roster spots in Orlando right now. Very few of them have NBA experience. Markel Fultz has some. Gary Harris has some. That's kind of it. Cole Anthony's young. Jalen Suggs is, of course, young. Franz Wagner is not really a guard. He's more of a forward, but he's obviously very young as well. This is just a young team. RJ Hampton is extremely young as well. So the, the best case scenario, Joe's not, he's not going to be any of those guys for a roster spot. He's not going to take a roster spot from any of those aforementioned players. It's just not going to happen. Those guys are more experienced. They have higher pedigree, more upside, more potential, whatever you want to say. I just don't think that that is a realistic scenario. I think a two-way contract is a very distinct possibility for Joel, either in Orlando or somewhere else. I don't think that's the best case scenario. I do think that there is a scenario where Joel inks an actual NBA contract, whether it's a guaranteed contract, whether it's a minimum deal, whatever it may be. I do think that's possible. I don't think two-way contract is the best case scenario for Joel, although I do think it is probably the most likely scenario. We'll talk more about that in segment three. Best case scenario for Joel EI is that his ability to do the little things, his ability to do everything, quite frankly, earns him legitimate playing time. Again, I don't think there's an outcome where Orlando has Joel EI starting and playing 25 to 30 minutes per night unless things go very badly from an injury perspective in Orlando, which I suppose could happen. That would not be the best case scenario for the Magic, and I'm not 100% sure that would be the best case for Joel. We saw Kevin Pangos get thrust into a role he was probably not fully equipped to handle in Cleveland, and it didn't go extremely well for him. 
for Joel, a best case scenario is that he's the eighth, ninth guy off the bench, but he carves out a role. He's playing every night. Maybe it's eight to 10 minutes. Maybe it's 12 to 15 minutes. Maybe it's not quite every night, but when he does play, he plays six, seven, eight, ten 10 minutes per game, kind of like Killian Tilly has done in the past. That's probably your best case scenario for Joel Eiei this season. Again, him being able to do a little bit of everything. He's a distributor. He's a good rebounder. He cuts. He moves well without the basketball. He's a good perimeter defensive player. He's a decent outside shooter. All of that stuff shows up at the best, the peak of what Joel is capable of doing. If he can show all of those skills at a, at a peak, he's going to be an NBA rotation player. The biggest one is the outside shooting. It's always going to come down to outside shooting. Joel Eiei shot 35% in his first real season at Gonzaga. He shot 39% the year after that, but we haven't seen the outside shot be super consistent since then. Like I mentioned, a five-game sample size in Summer League with the Atlanta Hawks is not a huge sample to go off of, but Joel shot 23%. That's not going to get it done. And when you're basically doing an extended tryout in Summer League, you got to knock your shots down more than that. Best case scenario for Joel Eiei is he makes defenders respect his outside shot. He shows Orlando or whatever NBA team he ends up with that he can consistently knock down open threes and defensive players have to respect him. That is going to get you playing time. If you can knock down open looks from beyond the arc, you're going to get playing time. It is the biggest, most critical skill in the modern NBA. And for Joel, all of the other stuff he does, the cutting without the basketball, the the, the really good floor vision, the passing, all of that stuff is great. But without the outside shooting, I don't want to say it's not useful at all. It's not useless that he has those other skills, but without the outside shooting, it almost outweighs everything else. It's that important for him to be able to knock down those outside shots. Other best case scenarios for Joel EI, the size and physicality are not an issue. Joel's not super big. He's 6'4", he's thin, he hasn't put on weight since he left Gonzaga there's a concern that his physicality is going to be an issue. In the best case scenario, it's not. He does not look outmatched. He does not look like he's struggling defensively to guard the opposing players. He looks like he can handle their size. He can handle their speed, their athleticism. He's just as quick. He's just as strong. And he doesn't look overmatched at all. The best case scenario for Joel EI is that he earns a legitimate contract. That at the end of the year or towards the end of the year, Orlando Magic fans, or again, if he ends up somewhere else, whatever team he's on, are excited about what he's going to bring to the team the following year. It is a foregone conclusion, or at least feels to many like a foregone conclusion that Joel will be back in that same uniform the following year. It is really hard to get to that point in the NBA. Killian Tilly did it, and it took him a, wh- it took him a while, but now he's a part of what the Memphis Grizzlies are doing. Joel has not gotten there yet. In a best case scenario, he does. He gets very close to being there or he's straight up there where you're like, this guy is a part of this team's future for at least the next couple of years or at least the next year. For Joel, he's got a young kid. He's a, he's a new father. For him to be able to go into the season and go throughout the year and know, hey, we got some security. We're going to be here for the rest of the year. We're probably going to be here next year. To have that level of security, it, it's the peak. That, that's the goal. Obviously, all-star games, all of that stuff is, is, is every NBA player's goal. But really, when you're in this situation, the goal is just, I want to stick here. I don't want to have to be looking for a new job constantly. Best case scenario for Joel Eiei, he doesn't have to do that. What's the worst case scenario for Joel Eiei? Well, that is the problem. That is what happens. He, We spend a lot of time trying to figure out where is Joel? Where is he going to sign next? Is he going to get a two-way contract? Is he going to stick in the G League? Is he going to go overseas? He's just doesn't. He's just nomadic. He doesn't have a home. It's hard on him. It's hard on his family. It's hard on his young kid. And it's hard. It's hard to develop as a basketball player when no organization is giving you legitimate development skills, programs. You're not working with assistant coaches constantly who are watching your game, who are watching your evolution. You're constantly switching organizations, switching teams, switching teammates. And it's a lot harder to develop and grow as a basketball player in those situations. It's really hard to do when you are having to learn new teammates, learn new coaches, what they prefer, what they see in you, the skills that they think you have, the skills that they maybe don't think that you have. When all of those things are constantly changing on a month to month basis. And we've talked about Joel Eiei has been a professional basketball player for less than two years, barely over a year. And he has spent time with the Los Angeles Lakers, the Orlando Magic, the Atlanta Hawks and the Washington Wizards already. 
that's that's tough. That's tough. To, that's a lot of coaches, a lot of player development staff, a lot of new teammates that he has had to learn and adjust to already. Worst case scenario, he spends time with two, three, four different teams between now and May or April, the end of the season. The worst case scenario for Joel Ai is that he doesn't play any more in the NBA this year than he did last year. He played 20 NBA minutes last year. Worst case scenario for Joel Ai, he does not eclipse that number again this season. Now, spending an entire year in the G League, continuing to grow and develop that year, if he spends the whole year in Orlando with the Lakeland Magic, and he that's where he plays the entire year, I don't think that that's that bad of a scenario. I would like to see him in the NBA. So would all of you. So would he. We all know that. But if Joel gets an entire year with the same coaching staff, similar teammates, they're working on his game, they're progressing him as a basketball player, I I think that's fine. I think that last year was generally a success for Joel Iyayi for the same reason. Yeah, he bounced around a little bit. He was in Los Angeles. He was in Washington, whatever. He spent spent most of the season with the Capital City Go-Go's, and we talked about his numbers, 10, 6, and 6 in the G League, pretty darn good. 31 minutes per night. He was getting legitimate playing time. He was getting better as a basketball player. If that happens again, I don't think it's that bad of a situation. But when you've been a professional basketball player for two years and the most minutes you've played in the NBA season is 20, you're going to feel a little bit of that strain. You're going to feel a little bit of that pressure of like, I need to actually get there. I'm tired of being almost there. I want to actually get there. Worst case scenario for Joel Eiai in year two, he doesn't. The ways that that would happen are kind of the, the opposites of the best case scenarios. The outside shooting is inconsistent. Whether it's inconsistent at the G League level, which is why he doesn't get a promotion, whether it's inconsistent when he does get opportunities at the NBA level, whichever one of those it is, if he's not hitting his outside shots, it's going to be hard for Orlando to carve out playing time for him. They have a lot of other young guards on that roster. They're going to find other people if Joel can't hit that outside shot. Other worst case scenarios for Joel, the physicality is a problem. Joel's under 200 pounds. He hasn't gained a lot of weight since he left Gonzaga. Worst case scenario, he's physically overmatched. Bigger, stronger NBA guards are pushing him around. They're getting around him. He's unable to stay in front of them. Perhaps it's impacting his offensive game as well. He can't create separation. He can't drive to the basket. His ability to go to backdoor cut to get offensive rebounds, though he relies on some physicality to be to be able to do that. In a worst case scenario, he's just overmatched. NBA teams, NBA players don't allow him to do that. He doesn't get to do some of the stuff he's very good at doing in the NBA because of the physicality issues, because of the size concerns. The worst case scenario for Joel Eiai is that he doesn't have a secure job by this time next season. That he doesn't have a secure job at basically any point between now and next season. I think there are absolutely scenarios where Joel Eiai ends up going overseas. We're going to talk more about that in the third and final segment because I don't necessarily think that's the worst case scenario. Him finding a secure place to play basketball, hard to call that a worst case scenario. Him continually getting cut, getting released, getting traded, signing two-way contracts, getting released from two-way contracts, signing multiple 10-day contracts, all that stuff that happens to a huge chunk of roster churn players in the modern NBA – All of that stuff, if it happened to Joel, that to me is the worst case scenario, not just from a basketball development standpoint, but from a humanity standpoint. That's really hard. It's just hard to be in that situation. I don't want that for Joel because he's a new dad and that sucks. That's difficult. So those are situations that I would consider worse than perhaps a situation where he plays somewhere overseas, even if he's at a lower level basketball. We're going to come back in the third and final segment of today's show. We're going to take a look at Joel's expected role, expected production this season, what I think is going to happen to him right after this. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zach. Still want to thank you all for making this your first listen of the day and remind you to check out the show on YouTube if you haven't done so yet. All right, we're talking Joel's expected role and production. Uh, Obviously, there's a wide range range of outcomes that could happen for Joel Eiai at this point. He does not have a guaranteed contract. I touched on that earlier, but it's worth repeating. Yes, he signed with the Orlando Magic, but he does not have a guaranteed contract. There is not any language in his contract that stipulates he has to stay on the roster, that they have to full on cut him if they want to get rid of him. He, he could be released at any time. So this is not a super secure position that Joel is in. And again, Orlando has a lot of depth at the area that they – that he would play that what he offers this team. They have other people who do that. Now I'm not saying that those guys are all better than Joel necessarily, but he's going to have to work. He's going to have to fight 
to get that playing time. He has a year of very strong performance in the G League under his belt. That's going to help him without a doubt. And if he does start the season in the G League, he has the ability to prove that he can play his way out of that. I think that's what's going to happen. I think Joel Eye is going to begin the basketball season in the G League. I do not think that he will break opening tip off for the Orlando Magic. I don't think Joel Eye will be on that roster. I don't think that he'll be sitting on the bench. But I think that he's going to start out with the Lakeland Magic, and I think he's going to have a good, good, good season with Lakeland. I, I think he's going to play in the NBA as well. I don't think this is going to be an entire situation where he plays – like he did last year where he plays 31 minutes per game in the G League but almost never touches the NBA. I think it's going to be a little bit better than that, but I don't think it's going to look dramatically different. There are so many players who are good enough to be NBA players but only barely. Like the ninth to 12th man on an NBA roster, if you take all of those guys and you take like 200 other guys who are like G League guys or high level European players or roster churn candidates. Like there's there's this huge group of, of players that all kind of fit right there. Joel's right in the middle of that. It is really hard to separate from that group. And I don't think Joel's going to do it this season, but I do think he's going to get more opportunities to prove what he's capable of doing. I think he's going to play more than 20 minutes in the NBA this year. I'm not confident they're all going to happen in Orlando. I'm not confident any of them are going to happen in Orlando. In fact, there's a month and a week, about five weeks until the start of the NBA season. There's a chance Joel Eiai is not rostered with the Orlando Magic or their G League affiliate at all by the time that happens. I hope not because, as I mentioned in the worst case scenarios in segment two, continually moving from place to place, continually having to meet new coaching staffs and new teammates and find new apartments to live and all of that stuff is really challenging and mentally draining and emotionally exhausting. But I think it's possible that Joe Eliai is not with the Orlando Magic by the time the NBA season kicks off. If he is, hopefully it's because he's secured a two-way contract with them or Again, best case scenario, maybe he plays well enough in training camp and does enough stuff during the next couple of weeks that they give him a guaranteed contract, that they take him with him to their opening game. I'm not banking on that. I'm banking on him starting the season with the Lakeland Magic, playing well there and getting multiple opportunities throughout the season to play in the NBA. Maybe it's because of an injury. Maybe it's because of you know, positive COVID tests if the NBA is still doing that. Maybe it's because he, there's just they have guys who aren't playing well and they want to give somebody else a chance. Orlando's not a great roster, and they have some talented players at the guard spots, but if they're fourth, fifth string guards, if they're 10th or 11th guy off the bench, if they're not cutting it, if they're playing poorly, there's no reason to not give Joel a chance, He, especially if he plays as he's capable of playing in the G League. I don't see any reason why his averages in the G League, you know, 10 and a half, 6, 6, whatever they were, I don't think that there's any reason to believe he's not going to do basically exactly that again in Lakeland, if not better. And if he's playing at that level, if he's distributing the ball well, if he's rebounding the ball well, if he's doing all the backdoor cuts, if he looks strong defensively, and again, the key, the kicker, if he's hitting that outside shot, if he's doing that in Lakeland, he's going to get a look in the NBA. And he's probably going to get to play more than 20 minutes. He's probably going to get to play more than seven games. But he needs to prove it at the G League level first. And I think that that's what Orlando is keying in on him for. They want to bring him to training camp. They want to see what he can do there. But ultimately, their hope is they can stash him in Lakeland, let him ball out for the magic down there, and have him on hand as an option to bring up if they need to. I think that's how this year is going to go for him. And I don't think that that's bad. I think if he gets to stick with the Lakeland Magic for the majority of the season, if that's where he's playing ball all year, he settles in, he's comfortable there, his family's there. And if he gets called up and he goes to Orlando, he's still in the same state. He doesn't have to travel across the country or th to a different country. Uh, he's still here in, in Florida playing for Lakeland, playing for Orlando. That's a great scenario. That's a great scenario. Maybe he only plays 10 NBA games this year. Maybe he plays 38 minutes in the NBA as opposed to 20. That's not going to look dramatically different. You're going to look at basketball reference and you're going to think that's, that looks pretty much the same. It doesn't look like he really did anything different. But to me, that would be a win. Him getting to settle into a new place, play for a coaching staff for the entire year, get familiar with his teammates, and get more opportunities to play in the NBA, that's a win. Obviously, it's not the best case scenario. I do think there are outcomes where things are even better than that, where he's playing consistently in the NBA or at least semi-consistently in the NBA. But I think that a, an outcome where he plays majority of the season in the G League, gets some looks in the NBA, but is just settled in the same location, that'd be fantastic. 
I think that would be fantastic for Joel. It would be fantastic for Gonzaga fans. And, and I mentioned this already, and I'll mention it again here real quick before we go. I think that signing overseas is not a bad option either. If the G League stuff doesn't work for him, if he if financially, if it's not cutting it because they don't get paid particularly well, uh, if he doesn't feel like he's going to make the, you know, spend a lot of time in Orlando, or if he just gets a really good offer. If a team in France calls his home country, they say, hey, we're going to give you one and a half million dollars. You're going to get a car. You're going to get an apartment. You're going to come play for this team in the Euro League. That's really hard to turn down. I'm not saying that offers out there. I don't know if it is, but it's reasonable to believe that European League clubs are going to be interested in Joel EIE if he wants to do that. Again, there are factors well outside of basketball here with the family, all of that stuff. But if Joel wants to go home or if he just wants to go to Europe and play somewhere out there, I don't think that we should look at that as any kind of failure, any kind of giving up, any anything like that. And I think that most basketball fans have kind of moved beyond that belief that that playing overseas is not giving up on your NBA dreams. It is not a, a f- the inability to make it in the NBA. It is just another way to play professional basketball. They get paid extremely well over there. Joel, again, is European. He is from France, so returning home to play professional basketball there, I think that is a success. I understand why he's sticking it out here, and I think he's absolutely good enough to be an NBA rotation player, and I think that the best-case scenario is that he becomes that, but I don't think him going to Europe and giving up on his NBA dream is a worst-case scenario. In fact, I don't think that it's – I think it's kind of squarely in between. I would. I think that that's a more lucrative, more appealing option than getting bounced around to a bunch of different teams at the NBA and G League level. So we'll see what happens with Joel. I'm excited that he got this contract with Orlando. Clearly, the Magic see something in him to the point where they they believe he is capable of helping them at the NBA level consistently this season. Whether he gets there or not remains to be seen. But the fact that they signed him is a great sign, and I'm very, very excited to see what happens with our good friend Joel Eie coming up after this. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Don't forget to check out the new website for written content at scorezagscore.com. Look out for more fun stuff coming later this week as well, right here on the Locked on Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube as well. Finally, thank you again to those of you who have made Locked on Zags your first listen of the day. Locked on WCC doesn't exist yet, but you can get more informed on the West Coast happenings by making Locked On Pac-12 your second listen of the day. Host Spencer McLaughlin and the local experts of Locked On take you across the Pac-12 in 30 minutes, five times per week. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags!